11 we were experiencing with just weather delays apparently. Let's pray and then we'll ask uh, the Lord to guide us as we work through this material. Father, we are thankful that we are so confident that your spirit works beyond our weakness, our sin, our frailty, and the fallenness of this world. If your spirit were not responsible for your word, Father, we would fail. But because your spirit is working and we believe in your Holy Spirit, we acknowledge that what you will do is faithful to your purposes. Grandfather, even this day, that we would be faithful to your purposes. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if I were to tell you, this, these are the three points of my sermon. This might sound a great deal like Dr. Larson's just that he was doing. Uh, these are the three points of my sermon. The first point is that the heresy at Colossae involved extremes of both hedonism and asceticism. My second point is that Delilah was not the one that cut off Samson's hair. And my third point is that the Hebrew idiom for getting angry is that one's nose blows. Now all those things are true. They are biblical. Why don't those make good sermon points? And I hope somewhere from Dr. Larson's instruction and others, there is something beginning in your mind called unity and purpose that's not evident in those points. I mean, you, they, they just don't fit together. There should be something like a Sesame Street tune going in your mind saying, one of these things is not like the other. In fact, none of these things belong together. Uh, and, and you recognize it's more than just a question of unity. There's a question of purpose, too. Why? Do we put this information in front of people when we preach? And it's that notion of purpose that I centrally want to address today as we think of the heart of Christ-centered preaching. We're really trying to search for the heart of Scripture. Why is it there? I mean, nobody's going to take a test after you preach. That's, you know, it's not just information transfer that we're talking about. Why is the information there? And a notion that I'm going to try to put before you now and then work on more tomorrow is the human slash scriptural purpose of the scriptural material, and therefore the human slash scriptural purpose of expository preaching. Because if expository preaching in its essence is trying to say what God says, then we want to make sure that we have found the purpose for which God was speaking. I want to talk to you in purpose in terms of fallen condition focus. If we would say, why is any text present? We don't have to really guess. I mean, we can, in some right ways, in some wrong ways, turn to our motto text like 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God, is profitable for doctrine, proof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. The man of God might be, and I'm doing King James, so the word there is perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now that, that perfect word is the artios term, the, the notion of completion. And uh, whether or not that man of God refers now to people of God in general, or probably more specifically, the minister of God's word, this idea of the word of God given to complete us in our task is important because there's a necessary implication that all scripture is in some ways dealing with our incomplete. I mean, if it's given to complete us, there's, there's a sense in which we are incomplete. And the purpose, therefore, of Scripture would be to address that incompleteness in us. We could look at Romans 15, 4. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that through patience and comfort of the Scriptures we might have hope. Whatever was written was written for our learning, but more than just information transfer, it's written so that we might have hope. Hope. What I try to train students to do is, is begin to see people differently if they see purpose of Scripture. And it is that they look at people and they see Swiss cheese. I look at people and I recognize they have holes in them. They are incomplete in some way, whether regenerate or unregenerate. There is still purpose of Scripture in completing us, conforming us more to the likeness and image of Jesus Christ. But that implies that our fallenness still affects us. And so when we look at people, we are saying, you're incomplete. When I look at 
Scripture, then what do I see? I see purpose, which is to complete us, to deal with our fallenness. All Scripture is inspired for that purpose. And therefore, as I go to Scripture and start thinking of its Christ-centered purpose, I hope what I'm doing is I'm looking, I'm saying, what does this text have to say about fallenness? What does it, how does it deal with the incompleteness of the people that are being addressed by me in this moment, as well as in a past time? The implications of believing that Scripture, all Scripture, has a fallen condition focus is, first of all, understanding that until we have determined a fallen condition focus of a text, we really don't understand it. Even if we can say many true things about it. If we don't understand purpose, we really don't understand it even if we can say many true things about it, I can tell you about the land grants of Israel and, and give you lots of true facts and information. But if I don't understand the purpose by which the Bible was included, for which the Bible was including it, then I don't really understand why it's there yet, and so I can't preach it yet. So that's a, a corollary determination, which is we should never preach on a passage until we have determined at least a reason why the Holy Spirit included it in Scripture. And it, it's not just so, you know, that Dr. Moon can ask you questions about it on an exam. I mean, that's, that's not the reason primarily it's there. There is some other <coughs> reason. We have to ask then, what is the fallen condition focus of a text before we can faithfully preach it? What, what is an aspect of man's fallenness that required, as it were, the Holy Spirit to include this text in Scripture? Now, in the notes that you'll get tomorrow, it's not, not uh, in front of you now. In fact, these are blank spaces in the notes that you're to get tomorrow. So I have to three-step procedure here to how we determine a fallen condition focus. How do we, we say Scripture has this purpose? How do we go about determining that purpose? The first step of which I think is this. We simply ask the basic question, uh, had Robinson taught us all to ask, which is, what does this text mean? And remember his work, which I like so much, is what's the big idea? You know, what's going on here? What's this text mean? What's the big idea? But a, a second step in terms of moving toward purpose and following condition focus is to ask, what concern or concerns did the text address in its context? You know, why was it written for those people at that time? So not just what does it mean, but, but why was it put there then? What function did it serve in its context? What concern or concerns did the text address in its context? Still, we're removed from the text in terms of our involvement with it, so that leads to the third, and in my mind, the most critical question, which is this. What do we share in common with? What do we share in common with those two or about whom the text was written? What do we share in common with those two or about whom the text was written? or even the one by whom it was written. So when I look at a text and I, I see there's Thomas's doubt, and, and my purpose is not just communicating to the people of God, Thomas had doubt. Somehow I'm supposed to understand that that was written for a purpose, and it wasn't just to inform me that other people have problems, I hope. It's to say, what do we share in common with Thomas? How am I like him or the people I'm talking to? How might they be like him until I determine that, that mutual condition between the people I'm addressing and the people of the biblical text, either about whom it was written or for whom it was written, I really don't know what the text is about. I define falling condition focus this way. The falling condition focus is the mutual human condition, the mutual human condition that contemporary believers share with those to or for whom the text was written mutual condition that we share with those two or four or about whom the text was written that requires the grace of the passage. In other words, again, if I'm looking at people like Swiss cheese, I'm saying I see in that person being described, or even the person who wrote them, there was some human fallenness being addressed. But I should be able to identify the diameter or the shape or the nature of that hole in me. Or in other people. After all, there's no temptation taking you but such as is common to me. 
And, and if that's the case, I ought to be able to make these mutual identifications and therefore have a purpose for my message. Now, some examples of the falling mission focus I want to be clear about. Obviously, sins can be a focus of a message, whether the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life are all gain, as is the transgression of any of the Ten Commandments would be a legitimate fallen condition focus. But I don't want to give you the impression that the only legitimate focus of a message, I think, is a sin. Grief isn't necessarily a sin, but it certainly is a legitimate focus of a biblical message because grief is a consequence of being a person in a fallen world. And the Bible addresses that aspect of our fallenness. Uh, other things for which we are not culpable, persecution, suffering of various sorts, are the consequence of living in a fallen world, and the scriptures address those things because they are focusing on various aspects of our fallen condition. Now, when you begin to see that scripture has a fallen condition focus, it starts having implications for all the dynamics of sermon construction and order. For instance, you just think of organization. If I'm organizing my message to deal with fallen condition focus, then hopefully these points are not just pointing about you know, the height of the walls of Babylon or what the Hebrew idiom for anger is. But I've got a purpose that all the points of the message are talking about. I learned a wonderful word from the Lutherans when they talked about every sermon needing to have a burden. What's the burden of the message? Well, I call that fallen condition focus. What's, what's the fallen aspect of people that this sermon is addressing? And particularly the place that I think we as evangelicals often fail to realize this, particularly when we're coming right out of academic settings, is the nature of introductions. That often our introductions are introducing subjects rather than reasons for the subjects. Today I'm going to talk about justification. Why? Why would I be interested? Because I'm going to take a test later? No. Because somehow I'm, I'm going to you know, show other people I'm smarter than they are because I know a just No. Why am I bothered? Often in academic circles, we are, we are wonderful at kind of stating the subject and quite poor of saying, here's the reason you have to listen. When we begin, even from the outset of a sermon, to say, I'm not just focusing the main points on a fallen condition, something people have to hear, but I'm trying to build within the introduction itself a sense of fallenness, of need, so as the deer pants for water, my soul will thirst for this word. I've got to hear what you have to say. That part of what introductions are doing is not just saying, there, those people back in Israel had a problem, but how are, how are you like them? And how am I like them? Why do we have to hear what God has to say here today? And therefore, it's not just for the listener's purpose that I introduce the notion of fall edition focus. It's also for my purpose. I don't have a sense of passion for the Word of God if I don't have a sense of how God is addressing where people are hurting or sinning or transgressing. It, it, I mean, after all, what's, what's motivating me to get up here? My own passion will grow if I have a clear sense of purpose. And it will even begin to articulate the way that I make applications. I recognize that when we're in seminary and we say, you know, the reason I'm preaching this sermon is because there is sin in the world. Now, there, there's a focused subject. And so applications start, you know, being about this sin and that sin, and, and you get shotgun sermons, you know, that applications are kind of all over the waterfront, or else they're just skimming across the surface of life. But if my sermon has a clear and precise fallen condition focus, if I am saying it's five minutes to midnight and she's still not home, and it was this way last weekend too, and these parents don't know how to raise a teenager in today's culture, there are people who want to hear this. And because I have focused the message, I've organized the message to deal with this falling condition focus, I drive deeper into the human condition. I'm not skimming across the surface. I'm being forced to, to focus my thought into application. Even John Rada says, after all, you know, this father of expository preaching for this century anyway, in terms of how we do it nowadays, even Rada would say application is the main thing to be done. That's 
why we're preaching for transformation, not for information. So if I'm, it doesn't mean I don't have information, but if my goal of preaching is to see lives transformed, then I, I better have a clear purpose in view. And the more precise it is, typically the deeper I'll drive and the more moving it is for listener and speaker alike. I, I usually try to tell my students, I, I wish they would never do application until they have finished their sermon research. Please know what the passage is about before you do application. But I hope you will not put pen to paper until you've determined what the application is. <clears throat> application should be the end of sermon research. Better know what the passage is about. But application should be the beginning of sermon writing. After all, you have infinite exegetical opportunities. You know, so many things you could say, how are you going to focus it on? By having a clear purpose in mind, which is hopefully a legitimate purpose that your research has shown this text is addressing. Now, I hope thus far you recognize what we talked about is basically just the negative. That, that Scripture is somehow dealing with holes in us. And we need to move forward to talk about that's, that's not just the purpose of a text or even expository preaching. is, is to reveal the human predicament. It's also to provide redemptive answers. And so I want to talk today additionally about the redemptive purpose of expository preaching. If all scripture focuses in some way on our fallen condition, and of course it's our answer to determine how, uh, why does scripture do that? Why does scripture focus on our fallenness? I hope the answer is clear. It's to supply the warrant and the need for the redemptive aspects of that passage. Thus, just as every scripture echoes our incompleteness, in some manner it should also be signaling the Savior's work that makes us whole. Not just showing the emptiness. It should be showing what fills the holes. And we have to say something here. If we've seen people as Swiss cheese, and what we say, you know what's going to fill that hole? Is you just do better. You just fix it. You know, just work harder. Have more prayer time, you fix it. Then it's not true fallenness we're talking about. If we're really identifying fallenness, then it's not man fixable. And so we're forced in identifying fallenness to think about the Savior's work as well. Our goal in redemptive preaching, I think, Christ centered preaching, another way of saying it, is to decipher the signals of Scripture. To determine as it's so, how is the redemptive message coming through this text? Because until we decipher those signals, we are not saying what the text says. In fact, we may be sending wrong messages. Let me give you an example. In our town, at five minutes of seven, on every weekday morning, the, the major news station in town, that's your equivalent of WBBM, it's KMOX in our town, Camo X broadcasts the thought for the day. And the thought for the day has a, a man by the name of Richard Evans speaking. And it sounds like it's directly from Mount Olympus. I mean, it's, you know, they've got in the reverb chamber that must be uh, just, just miraculous in some way. But I mean, you can, you can just feel the awe around Richard Evans. And he will say things that sound wonderful. And in my mind's eye, I hear or see, in my mind's eye, I see hundreds of thousands of people driving down the major highways of St. Louis, and many of them Christians, whenever Richard Evans is on, and he's saying things like, fathers, don't exasperate your children. Because the Bible says don't exasperate your children. You should not give them righteous cause for anger. You should be a better parent than that. The Bible says so. And you people who work for bosses, remember to work not as unto man, but unto the Lord, because the Bible says, and I just, you know, Christians all up and down the highways are like, that's right, Richard, you tell them. I hope they're listening today. You tell them. Just one problem with Richard Evans. He's not a Christian. In fact, he's the now dead leader of one of the major cults in our area. And you think, well, what's wrong with it then? I mean, he's saying it's right there in the Bible. He just says what the Bible says. What could be wrong with it? The thing I want to suggest is wrong with it is 
he is looking at the Bible with the wrong lens, or at least not enough lenses. <clears throat> what we are trained often to do in seminary is to look at individual texts with our magnifying glasses. So we get down real close, and we, of course, bring lots of information, but what we're doing is we're, we're in some ways, dealing narrowly with the meaning of the text. It, after all, says, fathers don't exasperate your children. And so I learn what fathers is, and I even look up the Greek word for exasperate, and I learn that it's used in Septuagint, and I learn that it means basically God's righteous anger toward his own people, and I apply that to fathers. So said, see, I've done it. I did, I did my exegesis, and, and now I know. I just said what the Bible says, so I've done my work, right? What I'm going to suggest to you is this. If all we end up saying to people is, you just be a better person. You just follow this moral instruction. That's what God says to you today. Just follow this moral, this moral instruction. That is not just a sub-Christian message. That is an anti-Christian message. And you say, well, it can't be. It just says it, right? I just said what the Bible said. You just used one lens. You got out your magnifying glass. There is another lens to place on the text. It is a fisheye lens. Remember what a fisheye lens does in photography? You put that lens on the text, and you're forced not only to look at the at that passage, that pericope, that verse, you're forced to look outward to the horizons. What, what's the context of this? How does it fit into the whole? How does it fit into the biblical message? What's its larger purpose as well as its, I'm sure it has moral instruction to give? Yeah, we, we have to say that. It's not, not okay for fathers to exasperate their children. But we have to say, is that all the Bible is saying? Then I will say, no. No text says, just be good. No text says that. If we're seeing it in its redemptive context. Of course, one of the, the premier writers in this is Gerhardus Voss. And again, this will be in your notes tomorrow, but just so that I can get my thought complete here, let me put some of the principles in front of you. Voss talked about three principles by which we interpret Scripture. Revelation is terminology. The first was what he called the progressive principle. He said biblical theology, which is what that fisheye lens is, forcing us to look at the Bible as a whole, biblical theology, not just exegetical theology, looking at it in the parts. <coughs> he said biblical theology is that branch of exegetical theology, which deals with the process of the self-revelation of God deposited in the Bible. Revelation, he said, is a noun of action relating to divine activity as an historically progressive process, a long series of successive acts. So he's saying God is revealing more about himself through the Bible. It's a, it's a long series of actions by which God is revealing more and more and more of himself. He said, secondly, and this was known as the organic principle, this progressive process is organic. Revelation, we said, may be in seed form, revelation of who God is. It may be in seed form, which will yield later full growth, accounting for diversity in presentation, but not true difference, because earlier aspects of the truth are indispensable for understanding later aspects of the truth, and vice versa. Now, a lot of language to say this. Some things, what we learn about God, are in seed form. We're, we're just kind of getting a germinating idea of who God is and how he's going to deal with his people. And some things are in full form. But he said, you won't understand the full form if you don't understand the seed. But by the way, you won't understand the seed if you don't understand what it leads to. We'll come back to that in just a moment. The last principle he talked about was the redemptive principle. Not only, as he said, is everything tied together, it's an organic whole, well, sometimes seed and sometimes full fruit. He said, Revelation, what's happening is God is revealing himself in Scripture, is inseparably linked to the activity of redemption. Revelation, he said, is the interpretation of redemption. What God is revealing to man is his own revelation of his redemptive activity. That's what all revelation is. <laughs> He said the context and content of some revelation, again, may be in seed form, as it relates to redemption. But it is intricately related to the mature message, and not properly understood or communicated until this relationship is made clear. Now just think of it in terms of the images. All right, here's an acorn. Let me tell you what an acorn is. Acorn is a little thing that squirrels gather in the fall. And, you know, it's, it's kind of pointy.
corneal gland, it's got a cap on the other end, the cap's kind of corrugated, it's smooth on one end, it's kind of rough on the other end, it's brown. Now I have just told you many true things about an acorn. Have I told you enough to know what an acorn is? What have I left out that's necessary that you know so that you understand what an acorn is? I have to relate the seed to the to the tree. If you don't, if, if I've told you all kinds of true things about the acorn, but I have not related it to the oak tree, you don't really understand what the, what the acorn is. And boss is reminding us that we can go far and wide, through, and I can say many true things about a text. This commandment says, don't steal. And I can tell you the word for steal in Hebrew, and I can tell you the various implications of stealing, and I can look later in the book and tell you the implications of how it's worked out about reputations as well as possessions, and, and I can tell you many true things, but if all I've said is, so don't steal. Don't do that. That's a bad thing. Don't do it. I haven't told you what it was about. Even though I told you many true things about it, I have failed to relate this acorn <coughs> to the old tree. After all, the law was our pedagogue, I do King James too easily, our schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. So if all I've said is this is things that you're supposed to know to do, but I haven't done what the Bible itself said it was for, which was to lead us to an understanding of God, Christ, His redemptive work. I haven't done what it was supposed to do. After all, what is the law revealing? It's revealing the holiness of our God. Surely it's doing that. It should also be revealing the inadequacy of man to keep God's law. Some, something's being revealed here beyond just moral precepts. After all, how did this law fit into the people of God's lives? Context becomes critical as we use that fisheye lens. As we think of these things, what I hope we're beginning to see is that because we are fallen, as I said, no scripture is just telling us what we must just do to complete ourselves or make ourselves acceptable to God. As though you know, we could pick ourselves up by our own bootstraps now and now we're acceptable to God. The Bible is not a self-help book. And so if all I'm telling the people is, you know, you just do better and God love you for that. It may sound very biblical. I'll say it again. It is not merely a sub-Christian message, however. It is actually an anti-Christian message. You can preach it in a mosque. You can preach it in a synagogue. I mean, what major religion do you know that says it's okay to steal? So if all we're saying is be a good, upstanding, moral person, that's not the offense of the gospel. Christ is key to every passage if we begin to see the passages in light of biblical theology, the whole. There are certainly key texts that I think you already know that relate these things. Paul in 1 Corinthians 2.2 is one of those key texts we use for biblical theology. Paul said, I resolve to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ completed and him crucified. You see, it would, it would have been insufficient to say, you know, know what a good moral example he was, what a good guy. No, it's the atonement. I resolve to make nothing known among you, to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's the atonement that's the key. You say, well, Paul, wait a second, that's not fair. You said all sorts of things in Corinthians about worship and sin and giving. And, you, know, you said all kinds of other things, but no, somehow not in Paul's mind. These things were related to a redemptive essence. Luke 24, 27, Jesus on the road to Emmaus, remember, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he revealed what was said in all the scriptures about what? About himself. Now the laws, you know, here are just absolutely critical. He revealed what was said in all the scriptures. If Jesus said that every text is about him, and we preach it without him, did we even say what he said it was about? Now, somehow these connections need to be made. And we're talking tomorrow about how we do those connections. But, but we, we need to understand there is a background to the text. There's a, a flow, a purpose, a connection to it all. It, it visually put before us in the Transfiguration, right? Jesus, there on the mount, who appears with him? Moses and Elijah. Moses representing the law. Elijah, the prophets, and what do they all come to give homage to? They all heal him. In that visual representation, it's saying something to us, I suppose, about what 
or textual, like kind of by analogy or something, just kind of move to the cross. If we're expository, if we're really wanting to say, I want to say what that text says, then, then the ways that I think that we have available to us are to see Scripture in, in one of these four lights. I think every text is either going to be predictive of the work of Christ, preparatory for the work of Christ, reflective of the work of Christ, or resultant of the work of Christ. I think you can go anywhere in Scripture and use those categories. I'm not saying those are the exhaustive categories. You may come up with other ones. That, that's fine. I want to at least be instructive, though. Somehow, every Scripture is connected to his ministry in some way. And, and these are ways of thinking about it. To me, the most critical, and, and a, if I could just give you two handles to walk away with today, it would be these two handles. It's under that category of reflective. How does every text in some way reflect the ministry of Christ? And by that I mean the redemptive principles of our God. I think you can go to almost any text, I don't know really the exception to this, and ask one or both of these questions. What does this text reveal about the nature of God who provides redemption? And or, what does this text reveal about the nature of man that requires redemption? So when I look at the law, I'll say, what does that reveal about the nature of God who provides redemption? Well, I learned that He is holy. That He has holy standards. What do I also learn about the nature of man that requires redemption? Even the covenant people could not keep the law. It, 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 was, it was not in their sufficiency or adequacy to do what God required. God had to make another way. And I, I don't understand the purpose of the law if I don't understand that. And I may look at the life of Samson, or I may look at the life of David. And one of the things I have to do is say, is what, this, is what David and the life is about is really telling me, now listen, you'd be a really good guy too. And you can beat up giants. You know, is that what that text is about? I hope what you begin to see is God is the only hero. God is the hero of every text. And so when I look even at a text like that, I'm saying, what does this text reveal about the nature of God who provides redemption? He works beyond a weak little shepherd boy who can't even wear a king's armor. What does it reveal about the nature of man that requires redemption? He can't even help himself. Here are the covenant people. They can't defeat their enemies on their own. They require an extraordinary work of God. God becomes the hero. The way in which we identify, I suppose, some of the places where we miss the mark, and I'll leave off here just talking about the nature of non-redemptive messages. How do we recognize at times that that's not quite right? It sounds close, but it's just not quite right. Because I confess to you, these are a lot of the messages I preach at times. I don't mean to. I teach against this stuff. And I end up at times looking at messages going, oh no, I did it. You know, I, it was just pure moralism there. How do I identify my own messages when they're non-redemptive? One is recognizing that non-Christ-centered or redemptively focused messages are almost inevitably man-centered. They're just saying, here's what you do to fix it. You know, these are the typical 10 ways to fix your prayer life or 12 steps to a better marriage. Here are just the things you do. Now, I'm not saying those are wrong titles or even wrong contents of messages, but if that's all it is, just man-fix-it messages, then we should recognize that isn't the message of Scripture. Now, it's part of the message of Scripture, but it's not the whole. In fact, it misses the mark. Maybe we can think of it in other terms. What I call the true marks of non-redemptive messages, which I identify as the deadly bees. You've heard of the killer bees. These are the deadly bees. Messages that basically say only one of these three things, or maybe multiples, but, but one deadly bee is bee-like messages. Be like. Just be like David. You know, be a good shepherd boy. Commit adultery. <laughs> just, just be like. Be like Isaac. Be like Jacob. You know, I think Scripture has a great wisdom in it in tarring almost everybody so that we won't say, just be like so and so, that we'll recognize there's something terribly wrong with that person. I recognize there are a few exceptions, but you should recognize there are very few people in the Bible that we don't have some kind of dirt on. Yeah. And, and, and that's important to know. So that's 
so that we don't end up saying be like, or even more devastating to say, so just be like Jesus. Just be like Jesus. God love you for that. Well, that's a sure way to depress people. <laughs> Who can do that? So be like messages are dead. Be good messages are also dead. Don't drink or smoke or chew or go with the girls that do. Just be good. Boy Scouts are good. Girl Scouts are good. Christians are good. It's good to be good. <laughs> it's bad to be bad. So be good. <laughs> and God love you for that. Now, we, you know, our theology knows not to say that. But if all the message is, and by the way, we end up reserving the Christ messages for the evangelistic sermon four weeks, five weeks down the road, you know. So we're just going to, for the next four weeks, do the be good messages. You know, be good, be better, be better, be better, be better. And what we don't recognize is, regardless of where our theology is, what do people hear? What they hear is, God will love you on the basis of your being good, and he won't reject you because you have been better this week than you were last week. And we know that is theologically wrong, but if all we're doing is preaching the moral instruction, it's exactly what people hear. It's what I hear. I've done some sinful thing in my life, and so I don't think you know what I need to do is I need to go to church this week, or pray more, or sing more hymns. That'll fix it. No, it won't. My works don't make it right. So if I'm just telling people, be good, I should recognize, listen, even our best works are what to God. Filthy rags. That's not going to fix it. That doesn't fill the hole. So if all I said to people is, just be good, that's not ultimately a Christian message. The last one, the one that really gets, is be more disciplined. Be more disciplined. Read your Bible more, pray more, go to church more, just do more. Be messages. All of these messages. Be messages imply that we are able to change our fallen condition. That our path to grace is made by us is the implicit message. Listeners are left to assume our acceptance by God is determined by our actions. That is the message of every other major religion in the world. That acceptance with God is based on our actions. It should not be what is preached from Christian pulpits, or even implied from Christian pulpits. There is no merit in keeping God's commands. Now, there's blessing in keeping God's commands. But when we have done all that we should do, we are still unprofitable servants. So if I'm teaching people, just do this, and God will love you, and God will fix it. So I've got to teach people to turn a different direction than to self. Now, are there be messages in Scripture? Does Paul ever say, be like me? I'm sure he does. I, you know, at least five times. In what context? Always, as he is dependent upon Christ. And it's that connection that we have to make. You see, be like messages are not wrong in themselves. They are wrong by that's all we said is be a good God. Now, you know, we don't say the Bible doesn't say be good, so now go steal and murder. No, no. What we are saying is to the moral instruction must come the redemptive truth. What does Paul say? He says to us in that great passage on fending off Satan and his war against us, he says to us, put on the full armor of God, but ultimately be strong in the power of what? The Lord. Be strong in the power of His mind. Yes, you fight. You stretch every nerve. Yes, you have moral obligation. But it is as you are in Christ Jesus. And when you tell your people now, you are in a war. Make sure they know who is in it with you. People are going to walk out the doors in just a minute from your sermon. To do what you have told them they must do. And the Bible has told them they must do. But who do they hold in hand as they go? I'm going out to do the work of God. And in my hand I have me, myself, and I to do it. Or do they walk out with the knowledge of the Savior and His work in their life? And how the Bible, this text is revealing that. What we're going to talk about is how
how do we do that? If we say it's not just a self-help book, how do we find Jesus in all of it so that we are doing the preaching that is truly Christian? We'll do that tomorrow.
The hole was, as it were, demarking what would be necessary to fill the hole. And when we begin to look at Scripture identifying fallenness, what is being identified here as what is wrong, what we're also identifying, hopefully, if it's true fallenness that we've identified, is the nature of what must fill the hole. And that's an important concept. Because so often when we talk about Christ-centered preaching, the mind immediately begins to roll in a certain allegorical method or various things. I'm looking at this Old Testament passage, and I don't see Christ mentioned anywhere, but I can think of something about Christ that relates to this. And I'm going to contend that is not Christ-centered preaching. That what Christ-centered preaching is, is looking for the redemptive truths evident in the text, in the immediate text. What, how does the text present itself in terms of representing the work of the mediator? And by identifying fallenness, I'm going to contend that we begin to see that. Now, just if you can follow with me on that, I now think I'm on the buff lecture. So the, the discussion number two, as we move into the understanding of how we develop sermons that expound Scripture and present the Christ who is there. Now, remember, Christ himself said he was there. Beginning with Moses and the prophets, he revealed what was said in all the Scriptures, those things concerning himself. Jesus said he was there. How do we do that? Just a quick review here. One thing that we need to be aware of if we are doing Christ-centered preaching is the, the moralistic, legalistic danger of what I call exemplary preaching, which is, uh, you know, be like messages. Remember, be like Paul or be like David or be like somebody. Just follow that good example as a mode of preaching that we're ultimately going to say is it's just another form of Phariseeism. It may appear to be biblical because you're citing things out of a text, but ultimately it's just a moralistic message. Some of you know this appendix title from a, a famous book by an author I will not name in the moment, but uh, at one point when he was writing on the necessity of Christ-centered preaching, he entitled an appendix to a book, The Menace of the Sunday School. In which he said one of the, the things that evangelical children run up against is well-intentioned Sunday school teachers who say, Now, Johnny, you be a good little boy and God will love you. You, know, you, you be good and, and God will love you. Or, Sally, you, you be a good little girl. And uh, this author identifies that as the menace of the Sunday school because it's teaching, again, not a sub-Christian message, but an anti-Christian message message, if that's really what people believe. You're good, and therefore God will love you. That hints at the necessity, item B, of the redemptive focus in all truly Christian preaching. Remember, if it's acceptable in a synagogue or a mosque, don't steal, be good. If, if that's all you're doing, it's not truly Christian preaching. It's beneath that so far. Expository preaching is committed to revealing what the Word says. And Jesus says the whole of the word was to present his person and work. So if we're not presenting what he said it was presenting, somehow we have fallen short of God's intention. We identified some of the ways in which this occurs as we've tried to look at identification marks of non-redemptive preaching. Remember, messages that are not sola gratia, but sola bootstrapsa. Um, <laughs> you just pick yourselves up by your bootstraps and do better. Up or down harder this week. You failed last week, so do better this week. These deadly bees, be like some biblical character, be good or be more disciplined. And remember, I always try to contend that no scripture anywhere in context says just be good. No scripture says that. It's not a sub-Christian, but an anti-Christian message. Why? Because such messages, though they take it right out of a text and seem to be extolling, you know, principles of Christian marriage, etc., if all we're saying is just do these good things, such messages inadvertently imply, and usually it is inadvertent, we, we think we're saying what the Bible says, because we're just citing what that immediate text says, but such messages inadvertently imply we are able to achieve self-sanctification, that it's our work that is sanctifying us before God, and that's why we're doing it. Or number two, that our acceptance with God depends on our conduct. That we're the ones that make it right with God. Or number three, and perhaps the easiest to refute biblically, but the one that comes most readily to our minds, that there is personal merit in moral behavior. After all, why will God love me more if I do this good thing? Because my work is meritorious before Him. I've done 
done something good. So he ought to bless me or forgive me or love me more because I did this good thing. Well, you just contrast that, contrast that with what Scripture says about our good work, whether it's the Isaiah 64, 6, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags, or Luke 17, 10, when we have done all that we were commanded, we have only done our duty, and we are still unprofitable servants. Uh, some of you are from Westminster Heritages, I am, so I just at least got one portion of our standards to cite at least what the Westminster Confession of Faith says about our good works. Interesting. We cannot by our best works merit pardon for sin. Interesting. Even our best works do not merit some degree of pardon. By them, that is these good works, we can neither profit nor satisfy for the debt of our former sins, but when we have done all we can, we have done one, but done our duty and are unprofitable servants. And because, as these good works are good, they proceed from His Spirit, and as they are wrought by us, they are defiled, and mixed with so much weakness and imperfection that they cannot endure the severity of God's judgment. Now that is a very interesting thought. That even our good works before a holy God are so mixed with human imperfection and wrong motive and selfishness, even our good works are subject not to God's commendation, but God's judgment. Believers being accepted through Christ, their good works are also accepted in Him, robed in the righteousness of Christ, remember. Not as though these good works were in this life wholly unblameable and unreprovable in God's sight. So the good works even blameable and reprovable in God's sight. I think of it in the way in which I was as a child once thinking I was doing such a, a great thing. I was uh, taught as a child, as all chapel men were taught, to use a cross-cut saw. That was my dad was out of rural backgrounds, and you know, that was just one of those rites of passage you had to learn to use a cross-cut saw. And we were, we were cutting lumber one day, my brothers and I, and uh, a log that was rotten kind of fell off the cutting horse, and as it, as it did, it, it split of its own accord. And because it was rotten, it kind of went into a very interesting shape. It, if you used a little bit of imagination, it looked kind of like a horse's head. And I thought that was kind of a nifty thing, as I don't know, a seven or eight year old child, and I took that horse's head and, and thought, what could I imaginatively do with it? And as my father's birthday rolled around, I took that horse's head and I uh, took a two by four piece of lumber and I connected it to the head, put a few two by four legs on it, put a rope tail on it, and then put some nails down the side of the body two by four and presented it to my dad as a birthday present as a wonderful tie rack. <laughs> now, you know, in my seven or eight-year-old mind, this thing was ready for the Louvre or something. You know, it was, it was just this masterful work of art that I was presenting to my father. And my father, in love, received it. And he took it in his closet and for years <laughs> used it as a tie rack. You know, and lean up against the wall to stand up. But, you know, he, he used this, this piece of rotten wood <laughs> You know, for his joy. Now, as I got older, I looked at that with some, not just embarrassment, but, but even disdain. Dad, would you please get rid of that thing? You know, I mean, look at it. There was a time in which I thought it was so meritorious and wonderful, but I learned to see it from older eyes, ultimately from my father's eyes. He received it in love, but he knew it wasn't worthy. Not really. Well, it, it's our best works before God. We say, well, look, God, look, look at these wonderful, filthy rags of mine. Wouldn't you like a few more? <laughs> now you would love me more. And God is saying to us, no, wait a second. Our moral obligation is here, but we should not begin to think of our moral obligation as what is meriting His grace. We don't gain grace. Grace is given. If it weren't given, it wouldn't be grace. Our best works are not meritorious before God. There is blessing in our good works, 
If you're faithful to your spouse, there is blessing in that. But it does not give you more merit before God. In essence, to continue here, our message as Christian preachers must be the Bible's message. All is of grace. Salvation and sanctification, for from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. In essence, it's up to every generation, I think, to rediscover grace. Because it is so easily obscured by the concern to gain holiness. Or for us who are preachers, more particularly, to compel purity. Why, why do I get scared of preaching Christ in all the scriptures? Or even the idea that I can't preach this commandment unto itself. Because I'm seeking to tell people, don't steal. Just don't do that. That's a bad thing, so don't do that. And when, when somebody comes and says, you know, that's not all the message that's there. We are meant by that passage to understand the nature of God's grace. There is His holiness on display in that commandment. But there also should be human imperfection, weakness, and fallibility there. And these things need to both be brought to bear on your understanding of that text. And people say, well, I don't want to talk about grace today. I want to talk about don't steal. Not to talk about grace because we're trying to compel purity is ultimately to fall short of the Christian message. And I will ultimately contend the power of God in our lives. That there is no ability not to steal apart from grace. Apart from the grace message, we cannot present what God needs to be presented for a passage. I love this quote by Martin Luther toward the end of his life, the sermon where he was describing the sum of the Christian life as he was taking so much of his law gospel distinction and nonetheless trying to say how does it bear upon the motives of the Christian life, he said this, It is exceedingly difficult to get into the habit of thinking in which we clearly separate <coughs> faith and works of love. Now here's a preacher saying, because of the goals I have as a preacher, I know it's hard to get into the habit of thinking it's, it's not just works I'm requiring of you. I've got to make you think of, of faith. And it's distinction. The faith in what God has done, not the faith in what you do. So this, it's exceedingly difficult, he said, to get this habit of thinking. Because he says, even though we are in faith, the heart is always ready to boast of itself before God and say, after all, I've preached so long and lived so well and done so much, surely he will take this into account. But it cannot be done. With men you may boast. But when you come before God, leave all that boasting at home. And remember to appeal from justice to grace. But let anyone try this and he will see and experience how exceedingly hard and bitter it is for a man who all his life has been mired in his work righteousness to pull himself out of it and with all his heart rise up through faith. In the one mediator, my works don't accomplish anything. I have to have faith in God. And that's a, that's a hard thing to admit. It, it hurts our pride. I begin to wonder even what my Christian life is about if it's not somehow meritorious before God. Luther goes on. He says, I myself have been preaching and cultivating it, this message of grace, for almost 20 years. And still I feel, this is classic Luther, I feel the old clinging dirt of wanting to deal so with God that I may contribute something so that he will have to give me his grace in exchange for my holiness. Still, I cannot get into my head that I should surrender myself completely to sheer grace. Yet I know that this is what I should and must do. See, I, I think the Bible in that organic process that we talked about false presenting the other day, that progressive and organic process, is infinitely wise. Even the fact that you would take an account like the Tower of Babel and you would plant it as a tower of emblem at the beginning of Scripture to say, watch out. This is the nature of man to try to build his way up to God. And it's not just the nature of unregenerate man. Even people with a knowledge of God are still trying to make it up to God by their good works. Babel becomes so early a message in Scripture because it is never far from any of us. We're still
still very near the Tower of Babel. If we recognize that, we need to make sure that we are not, as it were, communicating to others, even by implication, that they are to build their towers to God. So we want to make sure that we are developing redemptive, that is, Christ-centered messages. I really think of those as two ways of saying the same thing. And therefore, begin to uncover some key principles for Christ-centered preaching. A starting point for this is to think about where we were yesterday, the nature of the FCF, the Fallen Condition Focus. Because if what I have done in a message as the way in which I am organizing the principles, as it were, of what I am doing is saying, what I'm dealing with is that that hole in that Swiss cheese person, fallenness, as it were, and I'll identify this is part of man's fallen condition. It's something from which he or she, that person, he or she cannot rescue themselves. Then I recognize that true fallenness is not corrected by man's efforts. Making all legalistic, moralistic preaching self-evident and even self-defeating. If all this message has said is, here are three things that you do to improve your prayer life. Hopefully we will begin to say, now if I have not mentioned the one who is at the right hand of God interceding for me, if there is no mention of that in this message, I should begin to recognize that these prayers as high as I might build them up are still going to fall short by my efforts. That this should be self-evident if true fallenness has been identified as the problem that the passage is addressing. So, one way of thinking about that is in some of the distinctives of christ centered preaching. Uh, I'm going to here particularly deal with a very helpful book for me, the book Sola Scriptura by Sidney Gradanus, in which he talked particularly in how we use examples in the Bible. David, Moses, Jesus. How do we use examples in the Bible and preach from them? Because he said this is a way of understanding why if we are just saying here is a good example for you to follow or a good law for you to obey, and that's all the message is about. You be an encourager like Barnabas was an encourager. Why that falls short of the biblical purposes. He said this, exemplary messages, that is what I was calling yesterday be-like messages, just be like so-and-so. Exemplary elements of Scripture function as law. That is, it's necessary to know these things. You should know it's a good thing to be an encourager. You know, it's, it's not good to be a discourager. These things are necessary to know and do, but deadly to base faith or favor upon. I now believe that I have standing before God because I've been a good encourager. And that's deadly in the Christian life. I believe that my standing is based upon following somebody's example. Gordanus is wonderful for us in noting that the debate is not new. How do we use examples and how do we use law and all of that? He goes through that history, particularly in the Church of Holland, the Reformed Church of Holland. Though he does do these wonderful things for us, he identifies those who typically critique redemptive historical, redemptive Christ-centered, these are all synonymous names, Christ-centered preaching, are often reacting to these things that they perceive Christ-centeredness to be about. Often those who critique Christ-centered preaching are reacting to, number one, allegorical Christ-centered preaching that makes Christ appear in every Old Testament mud puddle and camel track. You know, they're, you know you're, you're kind of coming to some of these guys and you say they, they have found Christ in that camel track and you're kind of going, wow, how did they do that? You know, And then you discover there is this, this wonderful allegorical and imaginative frame that you know, has been constructed more out of somebody's imagination than out of Scripture. And, and so people think that's what we're talking about when we talk about the whole Bible being about Christ. They immediately look at those bad examples of allegorical method and think, oh, that's what they're talking about. I reject that. Well, well I reject that too. That, that's not what we're talking about. The other thing that is often critiqued about a Christ-centered approach is an antinomian approach. That because we're saying that works don't make you right before God, that therefore works don't count. You know, that, that they're now irrelevant. Antinomian Christ-centered preaching that negates the necessity of law in believers' lives, rather than what it should be, a true contextual exegesis of the conceptual elements of a passage that are revealing something about the nature of God that provides redemption, 
or the nature of man that requires redemption. So those people who are critiquing a Christian method are usually pointing at either allegoricalism or antinomianism. That's why evangelicals are scared of Christian preaching, and rightly so. These are mistakes. These are wrong ways to do redemptive preaching. Thus, we need to be clear to say what redemptive preaching is and is not to be clear about the methodology I'm trying to articulate. What re redemptive preaching is, I trust, is recognition of Scripture, all of it, as one coherent history of God's redeeming work. All of Scripture is one coherent history. Remember again, Paul's, the progressive, organic, and redemptive principles that tie everything together. Gradana says all personages and events relate to this one history. So everything in the Bible is about that one history. It, it has a context. The reason every heretic has his verse is that he can take a verse out of context. And, and what Christ-centered preaching is trying to do is take every passage and put it in context. But it's in the context of the history of grace, redemption, that God himself is revealing through that long series of successive actions and statements in Scripture. Gerdanus, uh, I think, says it well in this quotation I've got for you here. He says, correct interpretation requires that the pieces be related to the whole. Page 135 of that book, Sola Scriptura. He says, in opposing the fragmentary interpretation, which reads the Bible as a collection of biographies, you know, be like Tabitha, be like somebody, you know, just this collection of various things that are these moral examples for us to follow. He says, in opposing that fragmentary interpretation, the redemptive historical side stresses the hermeneutical significance of the unity of redemptive history. The unity of redemptive history implies the Christocentric nature of every historical act. Everything relates to the Christ revelation, as it were. Redemptive history is the history of Christ. He, st he that should be, he starts. He starts at its center. Actually, I should say he appears. He appears at its center, but no less at its beginning and end. Now, this sounds like the true doctoral dissertation it was. Scripture discloses the theme, the scopus of its historiography right at the beginning. Uh, scripture discloses what it's about <laughs> right at the beginning. And then he quotes Van Veer in Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15 places all subsequent events. Now, maybe I need to say, Genesis 3.15, remember, Proto-Evangelium, the, the, the first gospel, as it's usually identified, the, the promise that the seed of the woman would defeat the seed of Satan. Okay, maybe... Genesis 3.15 places all subsequent events in the light of the tremendous battle between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Between Christ coming into the world and Satan the ruler of this world. It places all events in the light of the complete victory which the seed of the woman shall attain. In view of this, it is imperative that not one single person be isolated from this history and set apart from this great battle. The place of both opponents and co-workers can only be determined Christologically, only insofar as they receive their place and task in the development of this history do they appear in the historiography of Scripture. So what Bernanus is arguing, looking particularly at the exemplars, the people in Scripture, as he is saying, no one should be isolated from the grand thing that's going on, the history of Christ. And we push it beyond that, ultimately say it's not just the exemplars I'm talking about. I'm talking about all of the events. I'm talking about all the statements of Scripture, all the literature that's presented, all the Proverbs and all the Psalms. They're somehow revealing something about this continuing history and revelation of Christ. In my mind's eye, sometimes what I see is a scene as though I am standing on a mountain looking over a vast battlefield from a Napoleonic war scene. So that you, you just see the, the armies before you in, in all their dimensions. I mean, here you have the infantry, and, and there you have the cook wagon, and, and there you have the, the cavalry, and over there you have the supply train, and, and over the hill are the spies, and, and, and it's all before you. Now, as you see all of those pieces, you recognize that they're all connected to the battle. 
The spies are not just about something unrelated. They have a role to play in this grand battle. And so as we begin to think about Scripture Christologically and think about what preaching should be doing if it's revealing what this event is about, I'm not thinking allegorically, well, spies are about seeing and Jesus could see into the future so the spies are about Jesus. You know, it's, it's not allegorical thinking. It's actually trying to say what specific role did that feature of Scripture play in the battle? It's something I can define, not just imagine. How can I see its purpose? That means redemptive preaching is not allegorizing to Bethlehem or Golgotha. Psalms say, the Psalms say that the heavens declare the glory of God. And let's see, it was a star that announced Jesus' birth, so that must be about the star of Bethlehem. No, it's, it's, not, it's not allegory that we're talking about. It is not paralleling to Christ's person, example of experience, rather than exhorting on the basis of his redeeming work. It's not saying, well, let's see, Moses there in Exodus 2, he met those seven daughters by a well, and he was the deliverer of Israel. And Jesus met the woman at the well, by the water. No, it, it's, not, it's not just paralleling, finding some grammatical or historic coincidence. That's not what we're talking about either. Otherwise, you know, you can make anything mean whatever you want it to mean. All you're doing is using your imagination. It's not searching for messianic lights. These are, again, basically Gordanus' terms. Some event that brings Christ to mind. Elijah met the enemies of Israel at a crossroad. And Jesus met our enemies at the cross. You know, he's saying it's not some sort of searching for some messianic light in language comparisons or something. When he ultimately calls leapfrogging to Golgotha. Whenever you leapfrog to Golgotha, basically what the preacher is doing is he's saying, this passage reminds me of something about Jesus. You know, it, so basically it's in my head now. And uh, this, this is what Christ-centered preaching is not. Leapfrogging to Golgotha. I see something in this Old Testament passage, or even this New Testament passage, and I kind of say, this reminds me of. That, that, that is not Christ-centered preaching. That's just kind of imaginative leaping, and you know, maybe show wonderful imaginative things. But it's, it's kind of like the, the historic debate over you know, Rahab's cloth that she hung out the window. Remember its color, don't you? It was red. And of course that signals the blood of Jesus. Or maybe it just says she was a scarlet woman. Or maybe it's that Israel had to cross the Red Sea again. <laughs> or maybe it's that... <laughs> You know, if it's just imaginative, you know, what does my imagination bring? What might be a connection? I'm not, now I'm not trying to systematize allegorical method or typology. There are better scholars at that than I am. I may have already crossed some of their lines. And that, that's not really what I'm talking about. But what I'm trying to make you see is that Christ-centered preaching is not allegorical method. It's not what's in my imagination that I can compare. It is this. Christ-centered exposition of a text is doing this. It's trying to say all the events, whether I'm looking at Eden or whether I'm looking at Noah or the patriarchs or Moses or the kingship or anything, Christ's coming, his death, his resurrection, the church, everything has a role in the grand battle whereby the seed of the woman will rule over Satan. It's all part of a grand scheme. And therefore, if I am talking about Moses, I'm trying to say, what, what was going on here? Where does this fit in the battle? You know, is, is this a supply train? Uh, are these the spies working? Is, is this the cavalry? Where, where, where does this thing function in the battle? It's not supposed to be some sort of imagination. I should be able to see historically, theologically, where does this fit in what God is revealing about himself? And, and I should be able to, to, to go wherever 
I need to in Scripture and begin to say, what purpose does that fulfill in the battle? And it's not just my imagination. I should be able, as it were, to perceive from the mind of God what Revelation is doing at this point. I mean, that's part of the task of biblical theology. It is not just, remember, to take out the magnifying glass and say, what is this thing unto itself? It is to throw the horizons out and say, how does this connect to the whole thing that's being revealed about the nature of Christ and his redemption? In this famous quote by Simon Blocker, who was writing in the, in the 1950s, The Secret of Pulpit Power. Interesting, this was kind of on the, the back end fringes of the biblical theology movement that was largely being abandoned by evangelicals at this time. He said this, Christian preaching is simply the proclamation of the divine crusade of redemption of God's way out of our human predicament. Now, I found this after I thought of that phrase, fallen condition focus, but it's really saying what Christian preaching is about God's way out of our fallen condition. Not our way out, God's way out. Another way of just thinking about this is just saying to oneself over and over again when I'm preaching on a text, if it's an historical event or a biographical event, to say to myself, no way. God is the hero. God is the hero of the Bible. He's the hero of this passage. And if the only hero that I'm presenting to people is themselves, you be good too and God will then bless you, then, then somehow you have become master of your own faith. But that's, that's a definitively non-Christian message. And so what we're about is preaching the divine crusade, not the personal crusade. God's way out of our condition. Now we start to have very practical questions when we're in homiletics classes, which is, well, all right, maybe I see that I'm supposed to get Christ in there somewhere. Where does he fit? And uh, what I'd like to argue is that, in essence, there's not a, a canonical plan for this. Sometimes people will start to say things like, where, where does Christ fit? If I've got, uh, let's see, the proposition goes up here, and then I've got, uh, you know, three, three main points. It is, am I supposed to mention the redemptive truths up here at the beginning, or, or is it supposed to be down at the end? And I'm saying that's, that's not the point. That, you know, that you can kind of almost always do, you know, kind of the three points with the altar call following. And, you know, that's, that's the three points plus. You kind of tack on the message of the Savior. And that's, I'm not saying that's wrong, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is recognizing when one has finished a sermon, however one has approached it, has the whole message led to an understanding of the cross's role, of God's redemption. I'm not even saying that you would mention the name of Jesus in the message. Or, or you might even cite the cross itself. But somehow you have to have people turn away from themselves. It, it's God's way out of their predicament. And if they're just looking to themselves as their way out, that is, a, that is an awful problem. A diagnostic way of, of doing this process that is not just saying where does the cross fit is this diagnostic method for Christ in preaching, a three-step process. In essence, how do you preach the cross? Although, again, hear me say, I really mean God's redemption, even an aspect of God's redemption, not necessarily the cross or even Jesus by name in every text, is to first ask this question, what redemptive principles are evident in this text? What redemptive principles are evident in this text? And this takes us back to the questions we talked about last, yesterday. I think you can diagnostic it almost any text with these two questions to get a Christ-centered focus. What does this text reveal about the nature of God providing redemption, or who provides redemption? Or what does this text reveal about the nature of man that requires redemption? I mean, even, even the tables of the law speak of those things in their context, if we'll see them in their redemptive functions. What application were these principles to have in the lives of biblical believers? What were they to understand about the nature of God who provides redemption, or the nature of themselves requiring redemption? And number three, in the light of how these principles fit into the overall plan of redemption, how should we apply the text to our lives? Now, I hope kind of ringing in your mind by this point is a very similar way that you discovered following condition focus of the text. Now is a very close method to how you convert now, as it were, to the formation of a message, thinking of those same principles. I'm going to stop right here right now because some of you need to leave, and we, we're going to keep moving forward into this next material. If you 
If you say this diagnostic method reveals a Christ-centered message, I want to now start characterizing what those messages are. What, what, what are those messages tend to be like? And then as we go into the last section, finally, the, the last sheet that you have on discussion number three, talk about what's, what's the real hope of this? Why are we bother? Is it just a method? What's the goal? So we'll come back to that. I think we have about seven minutes and then we start again.